good singing. Good to see you. I'm going to talk a little fast. I got some ground to cover, so listen a little faster, as I sometimes say. The Board Panda website has an article about Rain Price of American Fork, Utah. His loving parents every day would get him on the school bus and send him on his way to school, and he would he he would always see them, especially Dad waving at the front as he got on the bus. Well, it turned about 16 and started getting more and more embarrassed by his dad waving at the front of the house standing on the grass so one day he complained to his mom and his dad Dale overheard it and took it as a challenge as the article puts it to Rain's dismay and Dale's delight not only did the father decide to wave his son goodbye every day he decided to send him off dressed in a costume every single day for 170 straight school days uh, you can get online and see some of the pictures that his wife posted as he's dressed as a ghost or bat girl or the Hulk or Ariel with shell bra and all or just in a robe and a shower cap or sitting on a toilet in their front yard or in a wedding dress and some of you parents are getting ideas in your head. Sometimes children embarrass their parents. Sometimes parents embarrass their children. Sometimes it's funny and sometimes it's not. That brings us to this. The sons of King David have found themselves in a really bad place. Amnon has become a sexual predator, but so did his dad. Absalom, the full-blooded brother of the innocent girl, took vengeance on his half-brother and killed Amnon. He became then a murderer, but so did his dad. David's in a bad place. His sins caught up to him. He's now living through them, even though, even though he's been forgiven of them. Surely he's hurting right now. His young son died as an infant. His older son died at the hands of his next oldest son, who now is a fugitive hiding just like he was years ago. This is where we pick up the story in 2 Samuel. David has been mourning for many days because of Amnon's death. Amnon is gone. Absalom is staying away. For three years he stays away. David longs to go to him. Finally, we come to chapter 14. Canor suggests David is maybe 58 years old now. Maybe Absalom is 28 years old now. But life is becoming very complicated. Joab knew how much David wanted to reconcile with his son, so he hatched a plan. As Kirsch put it, Joab resulted to a little bit of theater to prick the conscience of the king. So he finds this wise and talented woman from Tekoa. You can follow along with your finger if you want, because I don't have time to read all of this. But she's supposed to play the role of her lifetime. She dresses up like, like this woman who's mourning the death of a child. And she goes to the king, and the king brings her in, and she falls in reverence before him, and she says, Help me, your majesty. He says, Why? She tells him a story. She's a widow. Her two sons got in a bad argument. One killed the other. Everyone rose up to kill the one that's left, but it's her only one. So what would she do if he dies too? She asks for a pardon, and David grants it. But she asks for more, like an oath from heaven. And he says, as surely as the Lord lives, not one hair of your son's head will fall to the ground. As Joab must have coached her, she goes on to ask for more mercy. Asking in some ways, if you would do that for a stranger, how about for your own son? In fact, asking, I guess, why don't you practice what you preach? After all, God in his law, she reminds him, shows mercy to those who are banished. So the punishment doesn't have to continue. The avenger of blood doesn't have to spill more blood. David says, can I speak freely since you spoke freely? Sure, so ask a question. Is Joab behind all of this? Yes, she says in a manner of speaking. But Joab gets his answer. Joab, Dave's, David's right-hand man and leader of the army, gets the word that Absalom can come home. So Absalom comes home, but there's a restriction. Don't come to the palace. Don't show your face in front of the king. Go to your own house. And this is where we see David conflicting, really, in some ways, wanting to show punishment and yet wanting to right the wrongs and just say, welcome home wrestling with justice and mercy and not knowing which to show, but he shows mercy in some ways. This is where we see the conflict but growing between the son and the father, even if the father doesn't know it. David might be reconciling his feelings and reconciling with his son, but his son Absalom, on the other hand, is scheming to take over the kingdom from his dad. And this is where we get a description then of Absalom, if you did not know this, verse 25. 
In all Israel there was not a man so highly praised for his handsome appearance as Absalom. From the top of his head to the sole of his foot, there was no blemish on him. Whenever he cut a hair, the hair of his head, he used, his, he used to cut his hair once a year because it became too heavy. He would weigh it, the weight, 200 shekels by the royal standard. Three sons of a daughter were born to Absalom, and his daughter's name was Tamar, and she became a beautiful woman. Absalom was handsome, as some of us men know we are too. Right, fellas? <laughs> But depending on your age, you might call him, more than us, a hunk or a hottie. From top to bottom, not one blemish. Flawlessly perfect, full of healthy hair, even thick and heavy hair. We don't know what a royal or kingly standard was, but if it was measured, even those freshly sheared locks sounded unrealistically heavy. Some think that must be an error. Others say it may be the cost of the hair, not the hair weight itself. But here is this picture-perfect specimen of a man, and he probably knew it. He flaunted it. He showed it off, showing his hair as the signature mark and gold standard. Family coming after him. Three sons and a daughter, and the daughter's a looker too. Her name's Tamar. Huh. Wonder where he got that name probably trying to honor the name of his abused sister. But by chapter 16, sadly, his sons are dead by then. Even in this role model of a family, full of models, I guess, who looked perfect on the inside, outside, all is not well on the inside. Take Absalom, for example. He lives three years away from Jerusalem, cannot see his father, comes back home for two years and still can't see his father. Five years desperate to see his father, maybe starting to hate him. I don't know tries to get with him, tells Joab, but Joab doesn't listen, calls him to him. He will not listen, so he sets his fields on fire. Now he comes to listen. Why did you do this? He answers a question with a question. Why did you even bring me here if I can't see the king? If I'm guilty, let him kill me. Joab finally sets up the meeting, father and son getting together. David brings him in. Absalom comes in, lays down before him. David kisses him, simple and profound, and seems to be over. But all is not right in the heart of Absalom. He will get what he wants. He just doesn't know what price he'll pay to get it. And the story continues in chapter 15. Absalom finds himself, acquires a beautiful chariot, I guess, some horses and 50 men to run ahead of him. Power on display, a vision of authority, impressive look, but Absalom wants the real deal, not seeming power. So he gets up early in the morning, every morning, goes and plants himself at the side of the road as those who come to visit the king in Jerusalem would want an ear there with the king. When Israelites from the surrounding towns, from other tribes would make their way there, they have a complaint, they have an issue, they have a call, they need some help. They would want to see the king, but Absalom would intercept them. And he would ask them, where are you from? What do you need? Sadly, he would say, there's no representatives here in the palace to hear your complaint. You want justice done? Sorry for you. He doesn't listen. No one can help you there. But boy, wouldn't it be great if somebody like me could be the judge of the land? Wouldn't that be awesome if I could hear your complaints and help everybody receive justice? You can see the words written there. That's my paraphrase. David's none the wiser. Three times now, David has been used, undermined, disrespected by his own kids. Probably sitting on the throne wondering why nobody's talking much to him these days. Why nobody wants to complain to him these days. There are some who think because of the Psalms that David's physically not well right now. No matter, Absalom will take over for his father if he will, and he can, and he does. Absalom would meet the people, and when they would try to bow to him and kiss his hand, he would grab them and kiss them first. They want to show the king's son honor, and he gives them honor first, and it works. It's all working, just as his dastardly plan is coming true. The people walk away from Absalom, never seeing the king, but saying, Wow, I like the king's son. They don't even know what's happening, but David is up in his palace, removed from the people, and Absalom is among the people, kissing them, stealing their hearts away from the king. 
nobody can tell the last time they talked to David. But that good-looking, helpful young man named Absalom, he should be the king. And Absalom has become a great politician, even in our day, huh? Campaigning on the idea that the one in charge is terrible and I would be better than him. He shows his love to get elected, acting like he's for the people. Does this sound familiar? And yet he's for a party of one, the party of me. And after two years of working the plan, stealing honor from his father, winning the hearts of the people, he figures he's got to do something bigger. So he goes to his dad and says, can I go to Hebron? I have to fulfill a vow that I made out when I was running. If God would bring me back home, I promise to fulfill it at Hebron. David, I guess naive as ever, sends him away peacefully. And ironically, David is blessing his son with peace while his son is plotting chaos and curses for his dad. Absalom sends out a secret message throughout the kingdom saying, listen, as soon as you hear the tribes, the sound of the trumpet, you tribes know Absalom is finally king in Hebron. And 200 men accompany Absalom from Jerusalem, not even knowing what they're getting into. He sacrifices there to honor the Lord, but really it's just scheming to better himself. And one of the ways he did it was to send his trust, send for his father's trusted advisor, Ahithophel, to join him. He does. Willingly, the conspiracy grows. Absalom numbers grow. And he's about, David, to get a wake-up call. So here comes a messenger to David. And the message is this. The hearts of the people of Israel are with your son, Absalom. And it's surprising to me that the text makes no implication that David's even surprised by that. Huh? No. Couldn't happen. Wouldn't happen. Not my son. It doesn't look like he has a bad feeling. It doesn't look like he cries or panics. But neither does he doubt the message. It's almost, it's almost like he knew it could happen all along. David knows he has some work to do. And he says, we got to get out of here. Come, we must flee or none of us will escape from Absalom. You know what he's saying? We must leave immediately or he will quickly overtake us and bring ruin on us and put the city to the sword. And those who agreed to do whatever they would do followed the king out of town. And he left with everybody, really. But not everybody, really. Ten concubines were left back in the palace to take care of business. And sadly, they will be taken care of, if you know what the text will say next. Terrible but true. David the king gives up his throne, walks away from the city, flees for his life. And maybe you'd say that's kind of cowardly. But by what David said about his son, he knows what his son will do to the people. And David compassionately lets the overthrow happen without anybody having to die. And you may say it's hopeless. I mean, this is terrible. What could David do? Watch. Because David will do everything he can not to hurt his son, but to frustrate him and defeat him. And when he learns that Absalom has David's trusted advisor, Ahithophel, he starts praying, God, turn his counsel to foolishness. And you'll see next week then the friends that will step up to help David squash the rebellion of his son. Well, a couple things to point out before we close. Number one, I think people in our day, as in that day, would have admired Absalom. I mean, look at him. Just look at him. Wow! What an amazing looking guy. Uh, these days, I suspect he could be gracing the covers of magazines, modeling for everyone. He had position. Look who he was, the king's son, next in line to the throne. He had power. What power he couldn't get, he would take. If he didn't get naturally, he would work for it. But also look at what he achieved. These days in America, you might get a pat on the back for working that hard. Even stealing if you have to. Manipulating, working to get what should not be yours. High marks these days for somebody who could appeal achievement like that. At this point in his life though, he looks so good on the outside. But he cannot hold a candle to his dad. Absalom has no character and no integrity and no conscience. Ladies and gentlemen who are young and unmarried, please don't marry a good-looking guy or a hot wife if she or he is bankrupt and empty inside. 
this is a good looking shell of a man at least when David was confronted with a sin, he repented. There's no inclination in the text that Absalom has, will, or ever thought of doing that. Even the sacrifices he makes before the Lord to honor him looks like it's a game. It's manipulation, it's deception, it's treason. Which brings me to this. David. Just like we read in Psalm 63, if you listen to that first scripture, I'm constantly inspired by David. He finds himself in some really bad places like right about now. And listen to his faith in God even as he runs for his life. The, uh, the, life. the ark comes out with David and David sends them back and says, take the ark back there to Jerusalem where it belongs. This is his word. Take the ark of God back into the city. If I find favor in the Lord's eyes, he will bring me back and let me see and it be in his dwelling place again. But if he says, if the Lord says, I'm not not pleased with you David then I'm ready let him do to me whatever seems good to him David has what Absalom cannot dream of having it's called faith and it defines David David sees himself in God's hands and completely there he knows it he trusts it and he says it and prays it stay or flee rule or run live or die God bring it on you decide you are a sovereign and I love that about David I, I want that about me too I want that to be said of my family that kind of a faith number three the last thing interestingly this is the second time now David has been moved to act because of a good story you remember what Nathan said now do you know what this woman has said a godly prophet a talented actress both speak fictionally but both tell powerful stories and effective stories that get David to move so could I tell you a good story that we've already said several times today could I tell you a story that hopefully would get you to act this story isn't made up, it's not fiction, it's history. And it happened right here where David is, right now. David walks out of the city of Jerusalem, across the Kidron Valley, and up the Mount of Olives, crying, weeping because of what just happened. Jesus, God's own son, walks out of the city, across the Kidron Valley, and up the Mount of Olives, to the top, to pray and to cry because of what will happen next. And the prayers are similar in some ways, but Jesus goes like this, Not my will, but yours be done. He didn't want to die, but he was quite willing and would. And since this was the only way to save those of us who were stuck in sin, trapped in self-deception, and headed for eternal destruction, he did it. And his plan was this. He, the sinless Lamb of God, would die on a cross to take away the sins of the world. Crazy, you say? Maybe but true. He offered his righteousness to those who could not have it on their own. I, for one, took the offer. His righteousness for my sins, I, for one, took the offer. How could I not? Jesus Christ died for me, and I died with him on the cross when I was buried with him in baptism. I died with him so I could live with him. I joined him. I was united with him. His death became my death. His resurrection became my resurrection. His righteousness became mine. And life, real life, rich life, eternal life, it's mine. Not because of what I have done, because of what he has done. It's all because of him. But what about you? This is a good day to be moved by a story. Moved so much that you would act that you would say, I will accept the offer and you would change your ways and you would change your life and you would live for the Lord from this day on. Follow Him in His death, in His life, and in the life to come. What about you? Let's stand and sing.